Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to your Friday afternoon webinar this week. I uh, thought we would offer something a little different for timing this round. My name is Lisa Dar. I'm the Director of Industry Relations and Professional Development with the Tourism Industry Association of Nova Scotia. And thanks for making time uh, to spend a little bit of time with us this afternoon as we continue to navigate through some of these uh, new and uncharted waters together with relation to COVID. As part of our ongoing efforts to support you as operators and uh, provide information that is timely and relevant, we've been leading and coordinating a number of uh, different files in response to the pandemic. So in addition to our Tourism Strong Digital Hub, we've been offering a number of supports around ongoing advocacy for some targeted supports for operators, practical tools like Clean It Right and so on. We've also been delivering a series of uh, various webinars that are linked to specific topics as situations and contexts evolve over the last 18 months. So today's webinar is actually a, a secondary one. Uh, Ron, you were so popular the first time we had to bring you back again. This is certainly um, a, an important topic for sure. We are providing this as part of our Tourism Reactivation for Industry or TRI program, which is being delivered in partnership with Tourism Nova Scotia. So our thanks to Tourism and S for their ongoing support of the TRI program. And as I mentioned, the subject matter is still somewhat uncharted for many of us and some of our uh, information and conversations may be reflective of that. So Ron is actually going to spend some time this afternoon reviewing the proof of vaccine requirements for Nova Scotia and answering questions from you as operators and managers in terms of both what that means for both your visitors as well as from a staff perspective. We're getting lots of questions around development of potential mandatory policies around staff vaccination and process and we want to make sure that you have current and relevant information to support. So Ron is joining us again today. As I mentioned in our last session, he's a graduate of Dalhousie Law. He was called to the bar in 1987 and is a partner at Pink Larkin, where he specializes in employment law. And he's recognized as a leader in providing uh, workplace issues resolutions with over 30 years as an advocate and litigator. So today, as he joins us for this second session, we're very grateful to have some insight from the legal perspective around this health protection order that was issued by the chief medical officer. And Ron Ron is going to outline that health order, explain how it can be used or referred back to when creating your own policies. He's going to spend some time reviewing that and then we're going to take some questions and I'll help moderate. So please use your chat or Q&A function in this particular uh, scenario and we'll look forward to uh, uh, reconvening and uh, sharing some of those questions post Ron's remarks. So Ron, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I thought I'd uh, spend a, <clears throat> a few minutes going over this uh, COVID-19 protocol uh, for proof of full vaccination because I, it has application to your industry. And it's sort of like an indication of where things are going to go with this proof of uh, vaccination and also mandatory vaccination for workers. Um, the protocol, just to give you a background about these protocols, under the Health Protection Act, the government has the right to enact health orders and it has enacted a health order uh, for the co for, that applies to COVID. It's an order that keeps evolving and it keeps growing and it keeps uh, getting amended and it's somewhat complicated. Uh, it's on the website, but then they also have these protocols and these protocols are referred to and become part of the order. So they're mandatory. So if you don't, uh, that means if you don't comply with the protocol, it can be fines and other actions to enforce compliance with the protocol. Uh, I remember when we uh, first uh, spoke, or I first spoke to you, I talked about obligations employers have to their guests or people coming into their places, and then obligations employers have with respect to the workforce, uh, with workforce safety. So um, this protocol seems to apply mostly to the guests that you'll be dealing with. And so um, in article, in the second, there's like section 3.1, where the proof of full vaccination requirement applies, talks about all the businesses or industries where full vaccination applies. And that's at page 10 of the protocol. And if you're looking for the protocol, it's on the website. 
the government website, the COVID resources. So this proof of vaccination is required for, for full service restaurants, for patrons sit at tables to be served both indoors and on patios, food establishments, uh, businesses and organizations offering indoor and outdoor recreation and leisure activities like climbing facilities, dance classes, escape rooms, go-karts, indoor arcades, um, places indoor and outdoor facilities where they have special events, arts and culture and activities, uh, indoor and outdoor sports events, indoor and outdoor extracurricular uh, bus, boat and walking tours, museum art, Gallery of Nova Scotia and public library program, uh, indoor and outdoor events and activities like receptions and so on and so on. Um, you can read that list, but it does apply. I would think it was broad enough to encompass most of the businesses in the tourism industry. And as a result of that, if you're covered by 3.1, then you have to apply with the proof of uh, vaccination. And the proof of vaccination requirements, what you actually need to do is set out in section two of the policy. So it talks about what full vaccination means, which essentially is getting, getting both shots if you have one on the mRNA uh, or you know the AstraZeneca and Johnson and uh, Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech. Um, different for Johnson and Johnson, it follows the recommendations. Uh, so that's what you need to be fully vaccinated. And then uh, section 2.2 starts talking about what you need to prove full vaccination. So um, that's changing too, because as they come out with the apps, then you won't have to collect any information. And you really don't want to have to collect information if you don't have to. So under 2.2, it talks about acceptable forms of uh, proof of full vaccination. Talks about uh, required information like the person's name, their brand of vaccine, an indication that all required doses for that brand were received, the date when the final dose was received. Um, there's also the QR code or the other acceptable form is the form that you were able to print out from the province after you got both shots, which uh, doesn't apply yet. And then there's also a requirement for valid ID. So not only do you have to get proof of vaccination, you have to get proof of valid ID, which is a driver's license, passport, a government issued ID, a health card, birth certificate, student card, et cetera. And you have to match the two to make sure that the person is fully vaccinated. And those requirements are mandatory. Uh, they are coming out with an app, I think. And I think there's something, uh, there's some indication um, that uh, they have, I think they have a tentative date for this app uh, later in October. Uh, starting October 22, Nova Scotia will implement Vax Check NS, a unique QR code scanner. And that should let you just scan their, the QR code and it'll give you a green sign if it's a good, you know, if it's a valid proof of vaccination and a red if it's not proof of vaccination. And then you have to um, match the code to the valid ID. There's also provision here for uh, dealing with people who come from outside of Nova Scotia who might be on a different system or might have different proof of vaccination and you can still accept that. And the, the important thing is that um, this is something that you're mandated to do. You have to do if you fall within uh, 3.1, and many of you do. We reviewed that. So, in terms of what you need in your policy, you can actually for for your guests, um, for your visitors, uh, if you need something in writing or something to put on the door to ad advise people, you can actually pretty much follow a lot of the information that's contained in the, uh, the protocol. You, you kind of summarize, you can say, you know, number one, we need proof of vaccination. This is what it means. Uh, you need a valid ID and so on. Uh, the interesting thing about this policy though, is that it, it doesn't apply to your employees. So now if your employee, for instance, was going to be a visitor or a guest or participate in, in an event you put on, then they, have to, then they have to comply with the policy. But if they're working with you, it's not, it's not imposed on them, right? So you, there's no obligation to have that policy as of yet. 
and that might change. The other interesting thing though, is that uh, if you look at section four, is that uh, the government recognizes that if you wanna have a mandatory vaccine and proof of vaccination policy, you can have one and it has to comply with what's in the protocol, proof of mandatory vaccination. I think they left off uh, employees for the moment because they're not quite sure what the impact might be on some businesses, whether you know you might find some reluctance or you might find yourself in a situation where if you did require full vaccination, that uh, enough people won't come to work that you're gonna have some business trouble carrying on your work. Um, then you have to think of what other alternatives you could put in place other than the proof of mandatory vaccination, like testing and, and uh, things like uh, you know, PPE. I think the way you have to look at it though, from a, from a business perspective is if you don't do something to protect your guests and you become a center where, you know, there was exposure to COVID and you don't have proper mitigation practices in place, you don't have proper ways to minimize the risk, uh, then, you know, not only does uh, you open yourself up to potential liability, but also you kind of hurt your brand because you become known as a place where people come and get COVID. I also think that there's that uh, what we've been noticing just ourselves as lawyers and with all our employer, with all the you know, employers we deal with is that more and more people, more and more organizations are bringing in mandatory vaccination policies to say you can't work there if you don't have your, your vaccination subject to accommodation if you have an illness or medical condition that doesn't allow you to get that kind of, to get the vaccine. And also on the website for your information is a form a doctor can complete, which details what the exceptions are uh, and they have to sign it and they have to confirm that person can't take a vaccine for, for example, if they have severe allergic reaction um, after administration of an mRNA or vial vector, or, but Anyways, the exceptions are very small. So there is a form to exempt people. And again, even if someone's exempt, it doesn't mean they don't have to take steps uh, to minimize the risk that that person might expose vaccinated people who will come to your place to COVID. So that's kind of where we are now with the protocol, the current uh, state of affairs, uh, I think, the mandatory vaccination requirement will change and who knows how this will all shape up over time as COVID becomes, uh, as we get better at protecting ourselves, as we get more and more people vaccinated and, and things like that, that might affect um, you know, the danger to COVID. So I, that's sort of a background, a quick rundown. Uh, and I guess I'm here to answer your questions. Thanks, Ron. That's great. So that's a very much a sort of 20,000 foot view, I know, of kind of the, the, the protocols, the requirements. Um, there are a couple of questions that have, uh, that have arisen here in the, in the side chat. One of them says, you know, what are what are the implications and is there anything that's been articulated yet in terms of uh, with regards to refusing refuse to work with an unvaccinated employee now this is from one of our participants and um, Paula I'll just get you to clarify do you mean um, an unvaccinated employee refusing to work or a vaccinated employee refusing to work with somebody else on the team who uh, is not uh, and or is there another context with that too? The question right now says, is there anything in place with regards to refuse to work with an unvaccinated employee? So, and Ron, yeah. if you have any perspective on that, you can jump uh, in. So if you have an unvaccinated employee, you know, you're in a really difficult situation, but, uh, you know, you're in a difficult, you're going to be in a difficult situation, first of all, having unvaccinated people at work. 
unless you've taken some, some measure uh, or best measure to try to minimize the risk that person poses to somebody. So uh, again, you know, it depends on what work they do for that individual who's not vaccinated. Uh, for instance, are they working from home so they don't have contact with people? Um, are they wearing PPE? Are they getting regular tests? Um, either are those risks you're willing to take uh, with the possibility of people catching COVID? And the more and more people get vaccinated, the you know the less the risk is, but still a risk nonetheless. And I, I think they're especially with this Delta variant. Um, so. If someone refuses to work, they get to make a complaint. For instance, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, the complaint has to be reasonable. I think there's a reasonable uh, apprehension of being subjected to COVID. Even if you're vaccinated from an unvaccinated person, there's a reasonable fear that you may bring that home. If, and if you have children to expose your children, we're still not vaccinated. <clears throat> so there's a reasonable concern. The question comes down to this. What did you do to mitigate the risk? And is the mitigation effort sufficient? And that's what it's gonna come down to. Um, and you know, why is the person unvaccinated? I mean, that's the easiest thing. So in this scenario, to just as an example, it was two room attendants right. and one vac it was uh, two room attendants at a property, one vaccinated, one unvaccinated, and uh, the, the vaccinated employee was refusing to work with the other room attendant uh, who was not, yes. Yeah, so your safest bet would be to tell the unvaccinated room attendant to leave and get vaccinated. Uh, that's, what I, that's what I would probably do. So in this situation, um, you know, it goes back to, again, the potential for uh, looking at development and implementation of uh, an operational policy that mandates vaccination for, uh, for the staff. I know that the initial piece was, you know, championing it and just being a, a, to be a good steward, to be a good operator, to encourage it. But the question here now, you know, is it just best to have a policy that just supports the mandate? Do we just try and avoid all of this by putting in the policy in the first place and stop tippy-toeing around it a bit? I think you put in a, you know, look, uh, it's so easy for me to say sitting here that that's what you should do. And I would say, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, that's what you should do. There mm -hmm. may be the odd circumstance where it's not what you want to do. And that's gonna be an issue I think you're gonna to have to sit down with and look at your, how your business operates. What will it mean for you if you have a mandatory vaccination policy at today? What, you have to minimize the risk. You just can't let unvaccinated people come to work uh, willy nilly, you cannot do that anymore. There's gotta be something you can do and is that thing gonna be enough? I mean. Are they going to have to be, you know, dressed up in gowns and masks and, you know, and how's that going to work? Uh, but the best practice, what a lot of companies are doing is going for this mandatory vaccine. In fact, I just heard, for instance, Newfoundland is requiring all public servants as of, uh, like they announced today, all their public servants have to be vaccinated. The federal government already has in place that all public servants and the federal government have to be vaccinated. They've also brought in uh, vaccination requirements in the transportation industry. So if you work in air, uh, rail, or boats, you have to be vaccinated. If you do interprovincial transportation, I think it's coming down there. Uh, you know, it's going to grow. It's just growing. And before mm -hmm. you know it, um, a lot of places are just going to have a mandatory policy. Universities have them private industry has them. So it's, it's just going that way. Thanks, Ron. So one of the one of the sort of um, adjacent questions to this then says, you know, how how does this apply now if you take into account things like work meetings or, or gatherings in the same manner? Um, you know, obviously, there would still be the same concerns around potential for exposure, potential for spread. Um, and, you know, Concern in that concern in that front. So, for meetings, um, 
we, I'll tell you what our office policy is. If you're not vaccinated, you're doing it virtually. Or you're not, or you're, or you're not coming into the office, right? Uh, and I think that's all the law firms. Most of them have that requirement that to come in as even as a, a a client, even though we're exempted completely from the policies because we're an essential service, you either have to be vaccinated, and if not, do it virtually. So people are using other things to make meetings work when it's not advisable to mix, you know, vaccinated and unvaccinated people. And although, mm -hmm. you know, you can think of Nova Scotia being very low risk. I mean, New Brunswick thought they were extremely low risk and look where they are now. You know. Yeah, things can move very quickly for sure with yeah. uh, when when things are, and, and plus with the shifts in um, reduced contact tracing and so on happening now it's uh, yeah. it's going to create potential uh, faster spread for sure um we're just asking for a clarification uh from uh, i believe it's dan jeffries you know please confirm businesses can make vaccination mandatory for employees uh, yes and the short answer is yes um and i'll i'll again i'll let ron speak a little bit more more specifically to the follow-up question here is unless the employee has a medical note. So Ron, if there's a medical, you know, like if there is a medical uh, accommodation being made here, um, what does the employee need to provide? If, the, if an operator decides, and, and let's face it, tourism is 99% of our, our work in the hospitality industry is face-to-face. -face. It's face-to-face -face with our guests and our visitors and with our coworkers. Um, so obviously, you know, th that, uh, you know, just saying, well, we'll work remotely where possible, that doesn't necessarily fit the bill here. Uh, so if businesses are looking at making a vaccine, vaccine mandatory process in place for their operation, and they have a staff member saying, well, I need a medical exemption, what is to be expected or what is the process that should be uh, adhered to there. So to get a medical exemption, there are specific forms. It's not just a note. If, if the employee just comes in with a doctor handwritten note, you know, uh, Susie or Joey or whoever can't get vaccinated, I don't, that's not enough. You, that's, you reject that. Um, there is a form that the Nova Scotia government health and wellness put together, which requires a doctor or nurse practitioner to certify certain things, certain, you know, certify that this person has one of a number of conditions, which are in fact the exemptions for a medical, for a vaccination. Now, just because they have the exemption doesn't mean they get to come to work unvaccinated, right? The accommodation doesn't mean you get to do what you want to do. It means that they have to be accommodated unless that, uh, creates undue hardship. So you have to, as an as a comp, as a business owner, you have to figure out, ask yourself what are ask yourself what are the possible reasonable accommodations, like PPE, working from home, and are, will those work or will they create undue hardship? And you know, for smaller op the smaller the operation, the more likely it is to create undue hardship. If it's undue hardship and you can't accommodate, well, then that person just gets to stay home without pay. End of story. If there is some form of accommodation, then you do it. And, you know, I, we can certainly talk about accommodations very case specific. So we look at in terms of what the obligations are. So, I mean, we've had lots of cases where, for example, someone uh, had to be accommodated in hours of work. They used to be able to work eight hours. Now they can only work four. So you accommodate them by just paying them for the four hours of work they actually do. So accommodation means different things. So, mm -hmm. you know, okay. they have a lot And I think, yeah. Go, I was just going to say that, you know, one of the follow up comments there was, you know, does the medical um, accommodation then actually require other measures such as masks and testing and so on. But I think you've answered that then that really accommodation doesn't mean necessarily this person shows up and gets to do their shift, quote unquote, um, on the floor or in their section or whatever their, their role in your operation is. Uh, accommodation is going to mean a different thing based on your operation and based on the um, potential interaction or risk level that that work would bring with it. And so just to be clear, you know, it's not a combination of the rest of the workforce. Oh, we have an unvaccinated person. Everybody has to wear a PPE. That's 
not how accommodation generally works, right? It's what can you do with your condition so you can come back to work in a productive manner? Mm -hmm. Is it going to work for me? Is that, or have I reached the point of undue hardship? Fair enough. One of the questions uh, from Carol, who's on this webinar. Uh, hi, Carol, thanks for joining today. How do we address mixed vaccines? It sounds like this might be an issue for vaccines that are not on a Canadian list of vaccines. Our labor pool is very diverse. Um, so there's some questions or concerns around, um, you know, labor pools coming from different parts of the world, perhaps having uh, mixed vaccines, not necessarily part of the typical Canadian list. Uh, how is that or is that addressed as part of this uh, protocol? Well, yeah, the protocol talks about vaccines. So it talks about, it defines what fully vaccinated means. So it says 14 days or more after receiving the second dose of a two dose series of Health Canada authorized COVID-19 vaccine, Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech, uh, AstraZeneca. So it, this includes a mix of these vaccines as one dose of AstraZeneca, such as one dose of AstraZeneca and one dose of Moderna. So yeah, mix is fine in Canada or in Nova Scotia anyways. I think in Canada too, you know, mm -hmm, it, this, mm -hmm. this, this thing of one, yeah, so that's fine. Uh, uh, you know, one dose of Johnson and Johnson and 14 days or more after receiving the final dose of any other World Health, Health Organization authorized series of COVID-19 vaccine such as Xenofram or Xenofac. So okay. we're following, okay. you know, that's the Nova Scotia policy that I think that's consistent with the Canadian policy. As long as it's approved, uh, I just don't know all the approved policies. That's one thing I don't know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what they are, yes. So one of the questions from a participant here says legally, um, you know, just to confirm legally, operators are protected if they tell employees who are not exempt because of very specific pre-existing medical conditions that they must get vaccinated in order to continue working. You know, again, this clarification, uh, yes, as an operator, you can create an, an, an organizational policy mandating vaccines for your staff. Um, and so just to confirm again, and this was uh, from somebody else on the system, just confirming indeed, that is a possibility. Um, one other note here says, uh, on another webinar that I was on, it was recommended that our staff policy actually just be the same as our customer policy. So if we mandate vaccinations with the staff, we would require them from customers, um, as the basis for staff vaccination is workplace safety. If we're a business that's not mandated, uh, for, uh, for customer vaccines, um, for customers to be vaccinated, then we would need to require it from all customers. I mean, that's a very common sense approach, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, you know, and uh, if you look at the, the protocol, it says a business or organized, so, you know, where you do decide to have a mandatory policy. So it says a business or organization that hosts events and activities covered under section 3.1 mm -hmm. of this protocol may choose to implement its own vaccination policy for employees, volunteers, and customers, members, or clients. Any policies they create cannot be less stringent than this protocol. So they're kind of establishing the ground rule, right? Right. So um, if you're going to do it, the benchmark has been set. This is the minimum that it can be. And you can go basically. beyond that, but you can't go less than that. So, and it creates a very, so do you have the policy? Don't you have a policy? How do you do it? And I think they're trying to give you some, trying to give uh, operators some flexibility in case they're in a situation, maybe they're in a specific part of the province where people might be generally opposed to vaccines altogether. And so mm -hmm. if you don't have unvaccinated people at work with the proper protections, then you may not have any staff to do work or not enough staff. So that's the challenge, right? I'm not saying every operator is going to face it. I don't think it's, it would be that minority of people it's not going to be the norm you're better off having a mandatory vaccine policy i believe that as a matter of practice but if you just happen to be in a weird or funky place in nova scotia where that's might be a problem then there's a possibility for some wiggle room here in this policy 
That's great. Thank you. Paul Curry is asking, you know, um, just to clarify from their perspective, the rationale for having the provincial policy put in place, uh, you know, Paul saying, I understood this to be a measure to improve vaccination levels by, uh, you know, by limiting non-essential activities or restricting access to those, rather than a means to sort of just say it's going to be safer at a specific location based on this. And, and you know, and he just goes on to say this might explain uh, you know, the exception for employees in the first place is, you know, you know, is your, your sense of this as well that, you know, the government moved in this direction more as a, um, a driver towards increasing overall vaccination levels within the population. So if you look at the policy, it's primarily directed at those people using these services and coming to a, like a, you know, a, 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 a museum or a hotel or some place like that or a restaurant. And I think what they did is not so much to increase vaccination, but so, but although of course it gives you an incentive if you want to go out, get vaccinated, right? I think it's more to make sure that we don't get this huge spread, mm -hmm. that we don't get some people who don't have vaccines suddenly show up at a restaurant and infect everybody. So I think that's the that was the primary driver. Though secondarily, um, definitely it's going to increase your uh, levels of vaccination because if you want to go out, and uh, you probably want to get vaccinated. You know, if you, if you want to eat someplace rather than just take takeout, you probably want to get vaccinated. So, but I think the driver there was to sort of like limit these spreading activities, these mm. activities that were you know. We get the huge community spread and things go out of control. Got it. So, and I think this has uh, addressed the majority of sort of initial uh, flow of questions that's come up here. Ron, on a broad um, employee policy perspective, are there some core, um, you know, is there a, a best practice or are there some core elements of that that we should take into account? Should it basically from a wording perspective, uh, be developed using similar wording to what we have in place now for our visitors or for our, our customers? Um, are there other components that should be taken into account when it's being developed more as a policy for your staff as opposed to external? So uh, I've seen, uh, so, you know, using the same one as the visitor one certainly makes it easier and you know you've got something that's approved by the government. Uh, or suggest it, and they they thought it through. They've looked at all the risks, so you know that's that's just the easy, low risk move. Okay. Uh, again, I don't know what the risks are. I mean, you know, you say, I guess someone might say, "We're well, not letting me work. I'm being sued." But I, you know, it is the low risk move. Uh, what I've seen in policy development is it's very. I I have seen policy develop depending you know, in the more sophisticated employers to tailor, you know, they, they take into account who their workforce is, they take into account where their workforce is going to be, and they tailor their policy to that. So for instance, uh, Brinks, I've seen the Brinks policy, it's more saying our customers are gonna have mandatory policies and a mandatory vaccination policy you can't attend unless you're vaccinated. I, I think they're thinking about it from the perspective of, you know, sometimes I might be able to have some people who have, for instance, they have runs where people would have contact with nobody, right? They're just mm -hmm. no servicing ATM machines, for example, right? Very little, very little person to person contact. So do they have to worry about uprooting their workforce? Can they change things around? So they have a very interesting policy the way they've put it together. Uh, and some places are just the straight out, sorry, no vaccine, no work, right? I've seen that uh, also in some larger organizations. So stay with it. I would say if you're not sure, if you don't know what to do, and if you don't have the ability to retain lots of counsel or to spend a lot of money on it, stick with what's in the protocol that's safe. Um, if you do, if you have concerns about how this might impact your ability to field the workforce, then sit down with a lawyer and modify from there, if you can. 
Having just said to that, that, go ahead. Sorry, you also, do. One more thing. That's of today, right? What we might find and what we're seeing is that I, I would not be surprised if there's going to be another protocol in another couple of weeks, which says you have to have a mandatory policy. And then everything I said today is kind of out the door. You need the mandatory policy. That's it. Got it. So twofold then. One, it's important to ensure that from a, a currency perspective that this type of policy has a, maybe a bit of wording in it that allows it to be revisited and adjusted based on whatever the current context of the scenario may be. Right. Um, so important to get that reviewed and I think clarified then by, by somebody who can ensure that you're not painting yourself into too much of a corner there. Um, and, you know, again, you know, you mentioned about the sort of some, you know, um, potential of lawsuits and suing and all that sort of stuff. The last time that we had the, a bit of discussion around this, you mentioned that your sense was that the courts were probably not going to be very um, open to entertaining what they would consider um, legal action that really didn't have too much of a, of a footing, especially if it came to uh, this whole aspect of uh, forcing, quote unquote, employees to get vaccinated, because there is a, a question around the greater uh, sense of public health. Right. Can you speak to that? Yeah. So. So when I talk about lawsuits, right, I, I look at it from a risk management perspective. So at the end of the day, do I think a court is going to uphold any person's claim to say, you know, I've been wrongfully dismissed because I refused to get a safe vaccine? No. Okay. I don't think that will happen. So what I mean by risk management is this. We don't get to that answer until we get to a judge at the end of the day, right? Some people can start lawsuits and the minute they start a lawsuit, it means we start incurring costs, defending it and start incurring costs, doing all this stuff, all the paper, you know, exchange of documents, la, 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 right? So when I say I'm, I'm not so concerned that we're going to have these results where people who refuse to get vaccinated, if there's no reason why they shouldn't get vaccinated, Will succeed, but they can cost us money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we Absolutely. want to try to yeah. Yeah, kind of minimize that cash sure. outlay if you can. Sure. So I do want to reinforce as well to um, to our participants that this, you know, resources such as expertise, that's this kind of expertise that we're talking about here today with Ron, um, we have these types of supports being made available through the Tourism Reactivation for Industry program. So the TRI program actually can connect you as an operator to um, individuals, whether it be those with uh, legal expertise, uh, financial expertise, uh, uh, insurance, HR, a variety of different types of elements that are really sort of um, creating a situation for our operators now where they're having to really rethink what their future looks like. Uh, so if you are struggling with questions around some of these issues, if you're looking to get some objective third party perspective, I would really encourage you to go on the Tourism Strong portal, jump on the uh, reactivation tab, which is the one on the far right when you're on Tourism Strong. And there's an inquiry form there, you can fill it in and send it off to us. Um, and confidentially, we will connect you with uh, some areas of support that you're looking for. And, uh, and we can help offset some of those expenses with the support that's being made available through that partnership with Tourism Nova Scotia. So Ron, I think, you know, this is really, again, going to be an ever evolving discussion over the next little while. Um, I know one of the things that we're having some discussion about right now is the fact that operators have been concerned with this new um, proof of vaccine policy that's come in play around some of the costs and expenses associated with how they are going to manage it. However, in general, we're hearing um, it has not come to play to be quite as significant as originally anticipated. That being said, uh, it's still early days, things could change. We need to see what this uh, um, uh, process is going to look like in terms of this new app or scanner that's going to be used for the codes coming up to um, hopefully make things a little more efficient for, for the process there as well. 
Before we wrap up today, are there any final words that you want to share to the, the tourism operators? We have a, a, a range of accommodation operators, uh, outdoor adventure experience providers, uh, restaurateurs, uh, food service providers, anything you'd like to share with the hospitality industry just in terms of things to keep in mind as we're looking forward uh, to the next few months as this sort of process evolves and unfolds? You know, I, I, I just say keep, keep an eye on, on what the government keeps putting out in these health protocols on the website. Um, really give serious consideration to putting in a, a mandatory vaccination policy. Mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day, that's going to be the easiest thing for you to do. Uh, but if you do have concerns, if you do have concerns of what, what that might mean to your operation, then do reach out to someone. And I don't think it's that expensive a, an undertaking to create a policy that might be tailored to your needs if you can do that, right? But, but it could be worth the money, right? I do think that things will get better. I do think that as we get more, you know, vaccination, as the our neighbors down south smarten up a little bit or get herd immunity, that will just make things a ton better. So better days ahead. Better days ahead. Let us keep everything crossed for that. Yeah. So as we uh, wrap up from today, I just want to let everybody know I have put into the chat section of the discussion the link to the TRI program form. Feel free to fill that in and send that in. If you're looking for some specific support from Ron or from one of his colleagues, um, then we'd be happy to help make that connection, of course. Just reach out to us and we will help facilitate that process happening. This webinar has been recorded. We will be sharing it with industry uh, as well for those that could not make it. For those of you that did, thank you so much. Appreciate you taking time from your day. Um, look forward to hopefully being able to see you all safely in person over the next little while as we continue to rebuild. Thank you, Ron, for joining us. Okay, thanks, thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Take care. Bye.